It was December 27th, 1992, and Lieutenant Colonel Gary North would not let the Iraqis trespass into the no-fly zone imposed around the Kuwaiti border. The box, as the air crews called it, was a restricted area implemented by the United Nations to protect civilians in Iraq and neighboring Kuwait from Saddam Hussein's abuses. As he led a squadron of four F-16 Falcons, North was warned of a contact rushing at high speed toward their position. He immediately ordered two of his pilots to go after the enemy, but in a matter of minutes, the hostile aircraft was inching closer to his position. The leader then instructed his men to cut off the threat, impeding his escape route and forcing him into combat. As he would later recall, quote, someone was going to die within the next two minutes, and it wasn't going to be me or my wingman. International Affairs Saddam Hussein came to power in Iraq in 1979, and his long reign was one of terror. On August 2, 1990, he invaded Kuwait, arguing that the League of Nations had stolen the territory. Kuwait was an independent country by then, but the dictator longed for the tiny country's vast oil reserves. Within a week, Hussein's forces seized Kuwait, much to the world's outrage. In response, the United Nations Security Council presented the Iraqis with an ultimatum. Should they fail to withdraw their troops from Kuwait by January 15, 1991, the sum of their joint militaries would take action against them. Even so, the Iraqi government and military did not yield, and on January 16, the UN deployed the bulk of its numbers. A broad coalition of armed forces, led by the United States and supported by the United Kingdom, France, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and dozens of other sympathizers. Thus began Desert Shield, the first operation in the theater. However, the campaign had started before the coalition was formed. As soon as Hussein occupied Kuwait back in August, the U.S. rushed its troops into Saudi Arabia with the intention of protecting the world's largest oil exporter from a potential attack. Then, following the Security Council's declaration of war, it was the U.S. that invaded Kuwait as part of Operation Desert Storm. Abuse of Power On the morning of January 17, 1991, the coalition forces started a massive bombing campaign. Using the latest American technology, they targeted the Iraqi military, including aircraft, anti-air defenses, and weapons factories, and also several industrial facilities from communication lines to oil refineries. About a month after the start of the operation, the coalition sought to finish the job with a ground offensive known as Desert Sabre. The mission began on February 24th, and in just four days, the war was over. Kuwait's capital was now under American control, losing less than 300 soldiers compared to 300,000 Iraqis. But despite being a lopsided victory, the Persian Gulf War would nonetheless have severe consequences for America and the world. President George H.W. Bush did not depose the Iraqi dictator for political reasons, but inside Iraqi borders, oppressed minorities like the Kurdish and Shiite rose up against the regime, causing further damage to the already battered country. In response, Hussein crushed the rebels with an iron fist, even using chemical weapons against his own people and igniting the wrath of the United Nations. The international community hoped Hussein would be overturned by his own people, but the dictator proved more ruthless and resilient than expected, uprooting any trace of disobedience. In fact, the conflict in Iraq was just beginning. The Box In the aftermath of Operation Desert Storm, the Iraqi Air Force strafed and bombed the Shiite Muslims in southern Iraq for the remainder of 1991 and into 1992. Not even two years after its decisive defeat, Iraq amassed its forces along the Kuwaiti border, conducting minor ground incursions into the country. It was then that the U.S. Air Force launched what would become one of its longest contingency and deployment operations. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council put forward Resolution 688, aimed at protecting Shiite Muslims under aerial attack. The resolution imposed sanctions against Iraq, 
forcing them to comply with nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons inspections, and adding dismantling, destruction, and import-export restrictions. The U.S. Air Force then launched Operation Southern Watch to enforce the United Nations sanctions, and on August 26th, President Bush implemented a no-fly zone over southern Iraq to support the international verdict. The original no-fly zone, known internally as the Box, comprised the entirety of southern Iraq below the 32nd parallel, and it excluded all Iraqi aircraft, including fixed and rotary-winged vehicles. In the aftermath of Operation Desert Storm, the remaining U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf directed their operations across all branches of the military, providing a newly organized Joint Task Force Southwest Asia with tactical command and operational planning. Flying activities would encompass fighter sweeps and patrols, reconnaissance, suppression of air defenses, airborne warning, control system support, and other special missions regarding would-be targets in the area. Within 24 hours of the presidential announcement, the Joint Forces were already conducting their first operational sortie. Provocation The Iraqi regime complied with the restrictions of the no-fly zone until late 1992. But as the coalition would not revoke the sanctions against them, the Iraqi forces responded with violence. On the morning of December 27th, the Iraqi Air Force finally sent their aircraft south of the 32nd parallel, threatening U.S. airspace control. A squadron of F-15 Eagles patrolling the area received a warning from an AWACS about high-speed contact rushing toward their position. A lone MiG-25 Foxbat had crossed into the no-fly zone. As several Eagles were sent to intercept the Foxbat, it took advantage of its superior speed to outrun the persecutors. Later that same day, Several more enemy fighters dodged back and forth across the edge, though careful not to come within missile range of the American fighters. Even so, one Iraqi aircraft made a colossal mistake and crossed too far, becoming trapped inside the 32nd parallel. Soon, a group of F-16 Falcons of the 33rd Fighter Squadron cornered the insubordinate aircraft, and after corroborating that the trespasser was hostile, Lieutenant Colonel Gary North received clearance to fire. The lead fighter then launched a missile and destroyed the Iraqi MiG-25 on the spot, marking the first F-16 combat kill in USAF service, as well as the first hit using the AIM-120 AMRAAM missile. For the time being, Hussein's forces refrained from violating the no-fly zone in the air. But on the ground, the ruler ordered the deployment of more surface-to-air missile sites across southern Iraq, detonating a whole new crisis. consequences. In early 1993, the coalition managed to coerce Hussein into pulling the threatening SAM sites out of southern Iraq. But a few days later, it was confirmed through a satellite that not all sites were removed. In fact, the Iraqi military was trying to camouflage some of them. In response, the U.S. president asked to end the threat once and for all and ordered a strike to smash the SAMs. On January 13th, 30 aircraft that included A-6 intruders, F-18 Hornets, and F-14 Tomcats took off from USS Kitty Hawk under a cloudy night sky. They were then joined by another six F-117 Nighthawks, six British Tornadoes, and six French Mirages. Meanwhile, a squadron of Wild Weasels F-4G Phantoms covered the Saudi border on the lookout for hostile SAMs, supported by four AWACS and 14 refueling aircraft. No less than 110 coalition aircraft participated in the aerial strikes over Nasiriya, Samawa, Najaf, and Al Amara. The Superior Air Force struck both missile sites and the Zafarania nuclear fabrication facility near Baghdad. Then, on the 18th, American and coalition aircraft pummeled the targets on the ground, followed by a rain of 45 Tomahawk land attack missiles launched from U.S. Navy warships aimed at the nuclear facility. American and Allied attacks ultimately struck 17 missile and command and control sites until Iraq's air defense capabilities were deemed permanently crippled. Follow-up At least half the Iraqi sites south of the 32nd parallel were hit by the Allies, 
before forces stationed in the region attacked the Iraq Intelligence Service headquarters in retaliation for the recent planned assassination attempt on President Bush during a visit to Kuwait. The U.S. Air Force then continued destroying enemy radars in the region well into the summer as wild weasels struck hostile sites. The Iraqi activity then diminished for most of 1994 as the troublemakers accepted daily patrolling by Southern Watch forces. Any hint of activity warranted retaliation or defensive protection by the coalition, forcing the Iraqis to lay low for several months. It wasn't until October that Hussein launched two whole divisions of Iraqi Republican Guard troops to the Kuwaiti border after the UN refused to lift the sanctions imposed on the country. As such, Operation Southern Watch would extend for over a decade. In 1996, the no-fly zone was extended north to the 33rd parallel, and inevitable clashes in combat surfaced. By early 1997, the air crews had flown over 133,000 operational sorties, and more than 86,000 occurred inside the box. The war finally came to an end in 2003, and the United Nations resolved to impose war reparations on Iraq, as well as complete acceptance of the sovereignty of Kuwait. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, don't hesitate to subscribe to Dark Skies and check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for many more historical and military anecdotes from the modern wars. Also, hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content, and stay tuned.